James B. Binko graduated from the Maryland State Teachers College at Towson in 1959 with a bachelor's degree in education with an emphasis in English and history. Dr. Binko served as a teacher in the Baltimore County Public Schools for three years. In 1962, he came to the Maryland State Teachers College at Towson as an instructor in the Department of Secondary Education. He held numerous administrative positions, culminating in his service as Dean of the College of Education. These are his reflections. Dr. Binko, thank you for sharing your own preparation for teaching here at Towson University and your subsequent career in education. Uh, this will add greatly to our understanding of the evolution of teacher education at Towson across time. Well, I hope so. And where we'd like to start is at the beginning. Could you share with us a little bit about your own early social context, where you grew up, the point at which you thought about coming to college, and um, when you can started to think about teaching as a possible career choice. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I grew up in uh, Baltimore County, mm -hmm. uh, in Steeltown. My father was a steel worker. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my first ambition was to follow in my father's footsteps, I guess as late as my junior year in high school. And I really? said that once at the dinner table and he looked at me and he said, young man, you will never go on those steel mills. Mm -hmm. You're going to college. That was my first motivation <laughs> for going to college <laughs> and taking it seriously. I thought, first of all, at this, going into seminary mm -hmm. and going into ministry, mm -hmm. uh, that did not materialize. I visited a couple colleges with my father and for a variety of reasons that just didn't materialize. I then thought about, uh, well, some, some folks, uh, including my, a couple of my teachers in high school, uh, seemed to think I had some skills in art. And I rather yeah. enjoyed that, 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 that area too. So I applied for a, an art scholarship uh, to, with the idea of going to either the Maryland Institute or another school for that part. Well, I didn't get the scholarship. Oh. So that dashed my, <laughs> my thoughts about becoming an artist. Um, uh, well then, uh, I decided that uh, Towson then State Teachers College mm -hmm. offered a good alternative. Mm -hmm. uh, as a school, that became the priority. What school am I going to go to? Well, it was close enough to home that it was convenient. Mm -hmm. um, for a youngster like myself growing up in uh, the, uh, the uh, blue collar area of Baltimore County, the idea of just going to Towson seemed rather um, elevating, uh -huh. you know? uh, and it was. I mean, so I decided to go to Towson, come to Towson, and I uh, lived on campus for the first two years Uh -huh. And then off campus for the, as a commuter, so-called commuter student for the second mm -hmm. two years. It was obviously during that time that I began taking a serious interest in becoming a teacher. Although the idea of teaching had never really, I had never really dismissed uh, in, in my uh, adolescent years, it now became a reality. That's uh -huh. what I'm preparing to do. And... Um, I, en I enjoyed that experience, both on campus and off campus. And Towson, State Teachers College, was a good school with a lot of good faculty. Uh, so, so the institution you, was privileged in that regard. Mm -hmm. When did you decide on a major? The major was decided for you in those days. You were majoring in education. Ah. Th there were no other majors at, I that, see. at that time. I see. This is in the late 1950s. 50s. Um, but we did have to choose, those of us who were preparing to go into secondary education, uh -huh. we did have to choose one or two areas of concentration, uh -huh. which not, however, could, could not be declared as majors, 
We weren't allowed to do that. I see. Your, your major was education. So I chose to concentrate both in history and in English. Um, history and geography in English. Uh -huh. And I spent a good bit, a bit of my class time as a student in those courses, mm -hmm. English and social studies and history courses. Um, that, again, pretty well um, also indica indicated uh, my, my thought at that time, and that was um, I would like to teach history or mm -hmm. history and geography or possibly English. In fact, the very first teaching position I was offered was a teaching position in English at a local high school. Uh -huh. I, however, dismissed that um, offer and uh, chose instead an offer to teach social studies and English in what in the early days of the core program um, was in the school where I began my teaching was called core uh -huh. um, and I was required to teach um, an amalgam of history and geography and current affairs and English and probably two or three other things that they throw mm -hmm. in. And um, that was part of core. Yes. Uh, uh, something that uh, 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 a little um, codicil there um, on my beginning teaching. I had the really unique experience, I won't say advantage or disadvantage, mm -hmm. but the unique experience of beginning my teaching in the same school and indeed in the same classroom where I was a seventh grade student. Oh my heavens. Just a <laughs> dozen years or so before that. Yes. In fact, uh, that, uh, th that experience, I would today dis discourage <laughs> for anybody, although at the time it seemed to work well for me. I, I, I really enjoyed the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, where did you do your student teaching? I did my student teaching here in, in Baltimore County. Uh -huh. We had two experiences then, two student teaching experiences. Um, another footnote on this is at the time, if you graduated from Towson State Teachers College in secondary education, you were certified only through grade nine, junior high school. You hmm. could not teach in the senior high school and be certified. Um, that, I think, that obligation, that requirement, I guess better stated, was apparently uh, the, the artifact of some agreement statewide that the teachers' colleges could prepare teachers through uh, junior high school. It remained for the capital institution, the University of I Maryland, see. and perhaps private universities mm -hmm. and colleges to prepare teachers for, for high school teaching. So when I left here, I had done my student teaching in both in junior high schools uh -huh. with marvelous teachers uh -huh. in, in good schools, um, thoroughly enjoyed it. And I then looked for a teaching position at the junior high school level. So you were confident that this is really what you wanted to do? This seemed like a good career choice? Yes, I got, I received good marks in my uh, student teaching. I received a lot of encouragement from the people who were supposed to know, Jim, this is a good, this is a good fit for you, mm -hmm. teaching. Mm -hmm. So, I would, and I felt good about teaching. Um, sometimes for the wrong reasons, I will admit. Uh, and I later, later decided, that was not a particularly good reason <laughs> to enjoy teaching or to go into teaching. Uh, by that I mean I had two master teachers to supervise my student teaching. Uh -huh. Everyone knew them in the local area I and see. they knew that if you had either or both of them to supervise you in your student teaching, you had it made because they knew all the tricks they knew all the pedagogy, uh -huh. and if you could make it with them, 
you would make it as a teacher. Well, I had the good fortune of having both of them for to supervise Wonderful. my student teaching. They were masters uh -huh. at what they did, and I copied what they did uh -huh. because that was what was expected of me. Um, I wasn't asked how would would you do that differently? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> you're going to do it this <laughs> way. You're doing it with do the it masters. This way. But one of the things I, I learned out of that, or appreciated later on, uh -huh. uh, years later perhaps in my teaching, is that um, control is only, you know, control of the classroom and mimicking someone else's good teaching. Uh, that's just part of the story of being a good teacher in the, in the classroom. Um, necessary in, in those initial right. steps, but uh, there were some few things that those two teachers, masters though they be, things they did in the classroom, which later on I could look back on and say, mm. that, wasn't, that wasn't good teaching really. Mm. That little episode, mm -hmm. that little behavior, mm -hmm. that way of dealing with the student problem. That was not, it, it worked for them, mm -hmm. and it would work for a beginning teacher. But theoretically, pedagogically, even in practice, I wouldn't look back on it and say, that's what I'd want another teacher right. to do. Right. But I did it, because in part I didn't know any better, and because it worked. There you go. So, we, you're, have graduated from Towson, mm -hmm. you're in your first position, and that's yes. in your own, in the same classroom. That's right. Seventh grade classroom. Same community. Same community. Same, where, same classroom where I was a seventh grade student. Uh -huh. And uh, it worked well for me. I enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed the youngsters. I enjoyed junior high school. I at one time thought, having taken all the subject matter courses that I did as an undergraduate, that I would certainly want to teach senior high school uh -huh. because those youngsters, in fact, the, you know, the brightest youngsters would be the only ones deserving of, <laughs> of all these content schools that I had learned. Uh -huh. Well, I was <laughs> wrong about that too. <laughs> I was accepted position in the junior high school. Uh -huh. I love teaching the junior uh -huh. high school, and thereafter, uh, even in my own uh, career as a teacher educator, if someone were going into secondary education, I would say, first of all, please don't ignore junior or middle school uh -huh. as an opportunity for uh -huh. yourself. In fact, Absolutely. I'd encourage you to go there uh -huh. because it's a, it's a great place to, to teach. It really is. It's a, it's a great level to teach. So. I have that, that, uh, that experience uh, at middle school, or in junior high for me, uh -huh. won me over. Yes. I, I no longer, once I had my I first know. couple of years of teaching uh, at, in junior high school, I was a firm advocate of the junior high school. There you go. Now, it was not long before you sort of reconnected with Towson University Mm -hmm. as a cooperating teacher? Yes. Uh, in fact, in my second year of teaching. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, I was informed by my supervisor that I was going to have a student teacher. Mm -hmm. and I thought, well, we could learn to teach together. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I, I, I don't mean this in, immodestly, but Obviously, I had been recognized as a beginning teacher um, as having learned a sufficient number of and quality of, in, 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 in the administration of skills in the classroom that uh, I received high marks for, mm -hmm. in my first year. Mm -hmm. So it didn't, didn't surprise me that I might be given a student teacher, although I did, hadn't asked for one. Uh -huh. Now, as it turned out, he and I had a good half year semester together. Uh -huh. Immediately after he, he left me, he went into the military service. In those days, we still had something called the draft. Uh -huh. 
and he was drafted into oh my heavens. the service. He later came back years later, and I saw him at a teacher's meeting. So I, yes. I know that he did go into teaching. Uh, whether he survived there for a, an entire career, I don't know. Uh -huh. But he did come back to, to try his hand at teaching. Yeah. And it wasn't long after that that Towson liked what you were doing as a cooperating teacher, I assume, and invited you to be more f fully engaged yes. in teacher education. And they were looking for someone that could get on the cheap. <laughs> okay. I, I don't mean that disparagingly, really. <laughs> but, no. They were looking for someone who was relatively young, uh -huh. recent, a recent graduate of either Towson or some other teacher's college to come in and teach some of the beginning courses in secondary education, in my particular case, in audiovisual aids in those uh -huh. days. Um, I was considered a real expert in the, in the matter of handling the 16 millimeter motion picture <laughs> projector in those days. Um, so, at, uh, so, so the uh, at. I'm sorry, I lost the. I lost your question. Oh, the question. Uh, it was just to to sort of segue into talking about that someone came and asked you if you oh, would become a you, member of the you. faculty yes. Yes. with your audiovisual skill <laughs> and other yes. sorts of things. Well, if I may, uh, you, uh, yeah, well, whether I may or not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I had, like many uh, young teachers, particularly in those days, male teachers who were still, you know, it was a day when, again, dealing with social context, when it was the male who was still considered to be the primary breadwinner. Right. And if you were a male and went into teaching, it was not surprising if you would soon put yourself in a track to do what? Go into administration. Right. right. So I had started that uh -huh. and I had just about finished my master's degree ah. in my third, at the end of my third year of public school teaching. Uh, and that was in educational administration? Yes, yes. And um, in the middle of that summer, the following summer, I received a phone call. Um, and uh, the phone call, uh, at the, the person at the other end introduced uh, uh, herself uh -huh. as uh, someone I knew from here at Towson. Ah. And I did recognize. Um, uh, and she said, wait, wait, Jim, we, she, uh -huh. we knew each other. In a, first day on the basis. And she said, I, I, I want and then Dr. Brown, who was then uh, 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 vice president ah. here at the, uh, at, at the then, we had, we had evolved into uh, Towson State College, uh -huh. no longer a teacher's college. Right. We were now a, a, a school that had diverse programs and various degrees. So anyway, she, she said, I, I, I want uh, Dr. Brown to talk with you for just, just a moment. Hmm. So this person, this uh, male, I heard this male voice at the other end of the phone, and he began talking to me about coming back to Towson, yes. this time on the faculty. Well, I mean, well, here, <laughs> I thought this was an old roommate of mine, and a, a great friend and a uh -huh. great prankster uh -huh. oh. calling me and pulling my leg. Yeah, playing a right. joke. On playing you. a joke. So I began giving him a hard time on oh, the phone. Oh, no. And I won't go into the <laughs> kind of buffoonery that, that uh, he and I would typically go through. But at any rate, to make a long story short, finally Dr. Brown convinced me that in fact he was Dr. Brown. Well, of course, even over the phone, I, I felt about <laughs> that tall. I really was hugely embarrassed. But he persisted. He, he had talked to me about coming back uh -huh. on the faculty uh -huh. here at Towson. And uh, I came and had an interview. And I actually, uh, not only accepted position, I got a $200 raise. Did you really? Over what they were going to offer me in the public schools My the heavens. next year. So I really 
felt uh, uh, inflated and oh, wow. and, and you should feel very good. Yes. Yeah. And you should. Uh, yeah. Because so, they called you for a reason. Yes, and a good reason, and it's something that I, I mean, was that learning was... really to enjoy, and that was uh, it was more than a vocation. It mm -hmm. was now something I really enjoyed doing, mm -hmm. doing teaching and planning for teaching, um, working with students. So you're at Towson University, and and you're probably not only teaching audiovisual. That's right. Courses. <laughs> what kinds the, of things? The you... introductory course the, uh, in right. secondary education. Uh, what well, then was called, still is, Principles of Secondary Education. There you go. A further irony. As an undergraduate student, in preparation for my own teaching, I, taught, I, I took a course called Introduction to the Junior High School. <laughs> that was the course we took in lieu of principles of secondary, secondary education and that was the course that distinguished us uh, in the state teachers colleges as being certified only oh for the junior high school nothing above that students for instance at university of maryland were taking principles of secondary education substantially the same course yeah and that would certify them of course to uh, to teach in the so high when, school so when you came here were we still only doing certification programs through ninth grade did that change very quickly that the, changed quickly in fact it changed uh, during the three years that I was not uh -huh. here so when you so came we back now, we were now preparing interesting uh, teachers for the full high range school. of of levels in high school and I after I gained a, a little bit of security my, myself uh, in those first couple of years of teaching I would say to my students in the principles of secondary uh -huh. ed class the irony of my teaching this course to you is it's fundamentally the same course and indeed we use the same textbook <laughs> that I took in a course called Introduction to the Junior, Junior High School. I'm teaching you a course that I wasn't allowed to take <laughs> <laughs> and which denied me certification in, uh, uh, in, at the in high, high school, school level just three years Isn't before. Isn't that funny? Yep. It's funny and I can only wonder if the chief of certification today would try to nab me on that, <laughs> protesting that it's a I, little late I, now, I was still I guess. not certified. <laughs> <laughs> to teach <laughs> for some 40 years. Oh, that's just uh, funny. 45 years uh, yes. at the secondary level. Yes. So. Um, you quickly moved into some more administrative positions on campus. I was very happy teaching. Yes. And I saw myself as a faculty member. In fact, yes. one of the reasons I came to Towson as a faculty member is that I thought, ah, oh, thank God I've, I've escaped the the pathway to administration to being a principal i can stay in the classroom and do what i enjoy teach if i want in the summer or go yes. travel with yes. family that type of thing and um uh, or as i was doing begin my work toward my doctorate during my during mm -hmm. the summer mm -hmm. that type of thing um but um yes after let's say in i started here in 1962 uh, on the faculty, and in 1970, I earned my PhD, and it was during that year, I had taken a four-year sabbatical from here to finish my degree, uh -huh. and it was during that year that some very exciting things were happening in, in what is now known as Columbia. Uh -huh. In those days, it was farmland, uh -huh. but they were starting to build right. this very adventurous idea, a uh, 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 concept of a, of a planned community with uh -huh. really eye-opening schools. And the then dean of our College of Education called me in and said, would you be willing, Jim, to go into Columbia on a daily basis and work with them in developing these schools, particularly the one in, in the middle school level? because that's oh, where I had, right. again, had my experience and also had done my dissertation. And uh, so for the next three years, I was working out in Columbia 
basically in what today we would call a professional d development school. Mm -hmm. Avon was teaching courses for, uh, for the university in the community out there. We had community-based uh, uh, schools for parents uh -huh. and community, community members, that type of thing. And from there, after three years, uh, I moved back into the classroom, briefly the university classroom. Uh, they then tapped me and said, would you be willing to go into the student, what was then the student teaching office, uh -huh. and work there as an administrator now? So I moved in, and I was in that office for seven years. It was during my seventh and last year there that the present dean of the college resigned, and I received a phone call from the then provost asking if I would be willing to serve as the temporary dean the acting dean, uh -huh. while a, uh, a search was conducted for uh, the permanent dean. Well, I had already accepted a sabbatical for that year. Yes. Um, but I thought, well, serving as dean for a year could be viewed as, you know, a, 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 you know, a, 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 a an Probably. internship kind of in administration well, it would and, be. and uh, so and just a different look another look yep. at what we do here so I accepted the opportunity and then they came to me and said well we, we're not <laughs> ready to do the search right now because we don't know just what the organization is going to be here among our colleges uh -huh. And I guess, um, were we even colleges at that point, maybe? Just they were figured, we were discussing them as figuratively as I see. colleges, yes, and treating them as, as colleges. Although, again, education was not, education was considered, forgive me, something of a stepchild in those days. We, we were not considered a college per se. Right. And, and that's interesting, given then that when you were a student here, this was pretty much what this institution was all did. About, yes. And it really didn't take long for that broader emphasis to, to change that perspective. Uh, correct. That, that yes. suddenly we were sort of this yeah. stepchild or whatever. Yes, right. They, so that the university fairly. really didn't know <laughs> what it wanted to do with education. Uh huh. At during that period of time. Fi finally, we earned uh, the designation as a college mm -hmm. with, I think uh, we began with, what, four or five departments mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. including instructional technology. Um, uh, but uh, that, that process, at any rate, that process continued to emerge uh, and during and along with the development of the university itself, let, let me pause to say that during this that time, from the early 70s to the present day, this institution has grown, to say the obvious. Yes. But if somebody is new to the campus and doesn't know it, this campus has grown like topsy. I mean, it, yes, you, exponentially. You've been here to see most of yes. that. Yes, I mean, there's just no, no easy way to describe it. Right. So, on one hand, that has created a lot of, that, that rapid growth has created a lot of uncertainties. Mm -hmm. But it also has created a wonderful climate uh, for opportunity. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to be uh, on the threshold of a lot of important changes in the institution. I myself consider the fact that I was here for four years as a student and then over 40, about 45 years on the faculty and uh, as an administrator, I consider myself very fortunate to have witnessed and been a part of all that change. Yes. As unsettling as it sometimes was. More to your point, yes, it was at that point that I, I, uh, that I pointed to just a moment ago where I was asked to continue for a second year as acting dean. Mm -hmm. 
that uh, the university chose to go f do a national search for a dean, permanent, a permanent dean, mm -hmm. a full-time dean. And I, by that time, had been snookered <laughs> <laughs> or uh, seduced enough by what I've since called the illusion of authority <laughs> that came with being dean uh -huh. that I thought, well, I, I, can see, I can see some things I might accomplish yes. here. So I applied for the job, uh -huh. and I, I got it. And so uh -huh. after volunteering to serve one year uh -huh. on an acting basis, I then served 14 years yes. as dean. Yes. And that was a good experience for me. Uh -huh. um, and again, permitted me. It was an me, exciting time for the university. And permitted me to see from yet another point of view. Yes. Life at the university, um, somewhat behind the scenes in some regard, to, uh, considering my the view that I was privileged to have as a faculty member right. before. Right. Um, gave me a great, far greater appreciation also <laughs> of what administrators here. Uh, in my particular case as dean, as a dean, uh -huh. what they have to contend with in terms of meeting the demands of ex rapid expansion right. uh, and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, in terms of your own tenure as dean, and a lengthy tenure it was, 14 years is remarkable for anybody to be in that position. Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of changes did you see over time that you from the perspective of the evolution of teacher education, mm -hmm. whether it be expansion of programs or curriculum development or technology or... Mm -hmm. Well, again... Or <laughs> accreditation or all of those kinds of yeah. things. Historically, again, uh, where this institution once was uh -huh. devoted entirely to the preparation of teachers, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the normal school and uh, Towson State Teachers College. Uh, we are now and developed over a period of some 40 or 50 years a number of diverse programs mm -hmm. um, where teacher education and the education uh, uh, component was now no longer incidentally the largest component on campus. Right. Uh, in the early 70s it was superseded by uh, the business college mm -hmm. as the largest uh, college on campus. And I might say during that time, um, a number of resources that were needed in education in terms of faculty and uh, technology, mm -hmm. um, due to necessity, other necessities, the university administration um, pushed those resources to areas like business and health and um, several others in, in, in order to meet the demand there. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, for instance, during that time as dean, when I would get together with the other deans and the provost to sit there uh, and divide up the new faculty positions for the next year, for seven straight years, I sat there like this, <laughs> literally and figuratively, because uh, our college didn't get any mm -hmm. new positions. Mm -hmm. In fact, we were going through a period as uh, the nation was in, in schools, uh, public schools, of attrition. Mm -hmm. School populations were um, getting smaller instead of bigger. I guess we had uh, educated all the baby boomers at that that's point. Right. And uh, so we were actually peeling positions mm -hmm. from our college, which meant in some respects we didn't have either the diversity or faculty members with the specializations that would have allowed us to uh, keep up with some of the current right. trends in, in education outside the, the campus. Um, so in some ways that was a very difficult time oh, to be dean. Absolutely. And uh, the, uh, the board of our, our then board of trustees uh -huh beginning in, oh, probably actually before uh, 1980 when I became dean and Hoke Smith became president, beginning before then, but certainly <laughs> in that year and the next year, 
the Board of Trustees was coming down hard on this campus and this administration to get rid of the laboratory school. Mm. Both because of image. Mm. We are no longer a teacher's college. And also because it was a drain on resources. Mm -hmm. And eventually they were successful in getting rid of the normal school. I mean, of getting rid of the... Uh, um, demonstration school. Demonstration, Light, demonstration school. Tall. Lightly tall. Lightly tall. And uh, so again, there we had to, uh, we, I, uh, our college had to deal with, uh, again, a reduction in faculty. Mm -hmm. There were then, I forget the exact number, but let, let's say about 10 mm -hmm. faculty, uh, tenured faculty in, in that, uh, in, in the Lytle Tall School. Uh -huh. There was no longer a school. Mm. Um, uh, to his credit, Hoke Smith, who was a champion in, in terms of um, uh, helping people and being concerned about people as individuals. He worked assiduously with uh, me and a couple others to see that those faculty from Lionel Lee Tall, um, if they wanted to remain on this campus, yes. they could. If they didn't, then he, he and we helped them find teaching positions elsewhere. Mm -hmm. a, f a few of them retired. Yes. Uh, but that was, that, that was an example of a very challenging time for us here on campus. No, one of, incidentally, and related to the, the teacher education, one of the accusations, and perhaps somewhat uh, correctly so, but it was dealt with not as a matter of fact, but as an accusation, and that is that Lionel Lee Tall, this demonstration school, couldn't possibly uh, handle all of our student teachers here on campus because we did have, even then, the largest teacher education program in the state. Right. And that school, at any one time, could handle perhaps 14 <laughs> student teachers. Right. If it had student teachers in every classroom. Well, it was never intended to no. be a laboratory for all of right. our student teachers. And none of our secondary student teachers, um, but the board honed in on that. Well, you see, it's that, that lightly tall, that, that institution sits there and is minimally used by the university um, in the actual preparation of any significant number of teachers. Why do we need it? Well, that was an answer. I mm. mean, that was a question we labored for several years to try to answer. Um, and uh, finally, having satisfied that we had answered the question, they closed us in. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. anyway. So. It sounds like a fait accompli. It was, yes. Mm -hmm. After all that effort. Considerable effort. Yes. And I will give, again, Hoke Smith much of that credit for even keeping an open mind to the possibility of, of keeping it open year after year, mm -hmm. even after the funding for it was virtually uh, stopped by the Board of Trustees, he saw, the, uh, he saw that school, the Lionel Lee Tall School, a matter, a very important matter of Towson's history and uh, as an institution, but also as a part of the community in terms of its relationship to the community. Yes. Uh, Lytle Lee Tall School had earned a, a regionally wide reputation as a laboratory school, mm -hmm. as a, a practice uh, school for elementary school teachers. And uh, Hoke was sensitive to that and didn't want to see it ended. He could, have, he could have put an end to a lot of misery for himself <laughs> if he had said simply on the beginning, right. Jim, it's, it's going. It's not going to happen. We're not right. going to right. protract its history yeah. or this agony mm -hmm. one bit. So. But there was a lot of um, public support for it and a lot yes, of there was. Um, awareness mm -hmm. through yes. the newspapers, the, mm -hmm. the Baltimore Sun, about this. Yes. So it had a lot of support. But it was clear, again, clear to those few of us 
behind the scenes mm -hmm. that the board had already made up its mind. Mm -hmm. It was just a matter of how long it was going to be. And again, that, that is important with regard to teacher education here, far beyond the limited number of students that it accommodated for student teaching right. and for observation. It was also a symbol uh, on this campus of the historical role in place of, uh, for the preparation of teachers on this campus. And um, it was sad to see it, uh, for that reason in particular, Absolutely. it was sad to see its demise. Uh -huh. Indeed, it was. Lots of programs, though, even though Lottie Tall was closed, um, the College of Education was beginning to look at new programs, mm. certainly looking at public education and the broadening diversity of the student body. Yes. 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 And so I think you were here when we were beginning to um, consider special education and oh, yes. the national mandate for for that. So. Yeah, I'd say two of the areas, not to the exclusion of others, but two that uh -huh. come to mind very uh -huh. quickly, that during that period of, of that period of time, uh, were attracting more and more attention, and increasing demand for resources, was special education. Yes. Um, and our uh, education's outreach to uh, youngsters of diverse abilities, limited abilities, uh, and other disadvantages, uh, handicaps, uh, and what we were required to do both by law, by, <laughs> by law and um, uh, by moral authority. Mm -hmm. It was just the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, what what is required of us as a profession and as a field of endeavor uh, to deal effectively with and for this in increasing population of of youngsters being recognized as having uh, a need for education but not in the standard form right. that was so that was one area uh -huh. special education the other was instructional technology, mm -hmm. or technology in, in, in general, but in particular, instructional technology. Uh, how to keep up with that, and where to keep up with that, you know, because an outlay, an outlay for uh, hardware uh, in technology is an enormous cost. Right. Particularly Certainly. when it's first introduced. Exactly. And, and and it hasn't begun to uh, find its, 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 its eventual level mm -hmm. in terms of cost and so on. So it's an, it's an enormous alley. But suppose you go out and buy the wrong thing. Right. Or that you buy something which <laughs> six months later they're advertising and they say, well, that's no longer, you know, um, that's no longer the, the, the premier. Exactly. Or that's no longer the one that they're going to be using in schools. Uh, Very important. So, uh, and we f found ourselves with that, I think, that dilemma yes. uh, to the present day. It's a matter of, uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, synchronize our efforts here and uh, allocate our, frankly, limited, relatively limited resources uh, in ways which uh, provide an, opt an optimal opportunity for our students and faculty to uh, be effective in, in the use and uh, the application of, of technology. And at the same time, not going down the, the wrong path or too many different paths simultaneously that the resources become strained and uh, uh, of minimal use. Uh, so you sort of have to jump in yeah. even though you might not be headed in the direction that public education elects to take. That's right, yeah. And certainly at the beginning there was great oh, uncertainty about how this was going to emerge and what things would look like in just a few years time. Uh, yeah, PCs or Apple, you know, <laughs> oh, I or, know. You know, such you know, issues we, as that. Yes, 
And that was a big issue because mm -hmm. higher education and most corporate life chose PCs. Mm -hmm. And the Microsoft operating system and public schools went Apple, right. at least to mm -hmm. start. Mm -hmm. And so we were just really in quite a dilemma, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, indeed. Well, again, to their, to I think the university's credit, I had a, and I don't think it was primarily because I had left as dean. <laughs> the decision was made at the uh, at the university level, almost well concurrent with my departure and another dean coming on, that the university would make a, an enormous investment in technology. Consequently, I think there was an ad there were additional fees, university oh, fees. Yes that students had to pay, um, but that was the only way, uh, only feasible way for the university to have any chance to uh, maintain an adequate uh, uh, fund for developing the, the technology base infrastructure on this campus in the absence of any uh, uh, stream of funding from the state mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, in the area of special education, uh, the state began requiring additional courses of our prospective teachers in, uh, in uh, special education. That meant at a minimum, we had to go out and hire additional faculty. Yes. And then as we developed a major in the program, uh, that meant additional resources, including uh, senior faculty to be uh, hired. and. Uh, so those two areas, uh, again, I'm sure there's a third and a fourth <laughs> that I should but mention, those but those are two which have achieved uh, a great deal of, of a notoriety, really. Mm -hmm. uh, Indeed. Yeah, and, and have demanded uh, a, a, an infusion of, of resources in order for the institution to, sort to of stay it. up. Mm -hmm. And getting back to teacher education, mm -hmm for our students here to have any chance to recognize themselves as able to deal uh, with, in the first case, youngsters with, uh, of exception, you know, exceptional youngsters, uh -huh. special ed, uh -huh. and the technology that's going to greet them when they walk into the classroom. Exactly. Um, so uh, those have been two of the challenges, uh -huh. not all of them, but Two of the challenges, or examples of challenges, yes. which we began to deal with in the 70s, mm -hmm. early 80s, and, and yeah. presently, I mean, yeah. it's still, uh, it's still a challenge. Yep. It's mm -hmm. expensive. Expensive. Yep. While you were working here, you sort of had an element of your personal career that was related to Towson, but was mm -hmm. separate and apart from, to some extent, too. And that's your relationship with the National Geographic Society. Um, one of the things that often is said, or had been said, I should say, about Towson University students is that we were somewhat parochial in our perspective. And I'm not certain that um, they had too much of a sense of a greater geography. But so to be interested in something that w would be helpful in terms of, I don't know, professional development for teachers mm -hmm. related to that sounds like an exciting thing to be part of and something that also was probably necessary. Mm -hmm. So um, would you share with us, tell us a little bit about your involvement with that group and what, what you were doing? <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, in, in, 19, in the 1980s, in fact, in 1984, 85, Gil Grosvenor, then president and CEO of the National Geographic Society and grandson of the founder of mm. the National Geographic Society, he expressed a longstanding interest of his in promoting geography nationwide, mm -hmm. getting it into the schools. Um, and so he, he convened a group in his office at National Geographic Society 
in Washington, D.C., uh, involving uh, several teacher educators, a number of his own vice presidents, uh, and several geographers, and, uh, and posed that question, what, if anything, can be done to promote geography and geography education nationwide? Mm -hmm. Given that his view was that geography was, in some school systems, uh, a missing component entirely. It just wasn't even taught anymore. There were some universities and colleges where they had done away with geography departments. We, for, a little, for years, have had a very prominent department of geography yes. at, at, here at Towson. And if we, one looked only at the, our example here on our campus, you'd be startled, I mean, <laughs> at least stunned to find out that some campuses had actually eliminated the, the department. Um, so anyway, but, but that was the situation that uh, concerned Gil Grosvenor uh -huh. for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. uh, being the CEO and president of the National Geographic Society. Um, and so he, uh, to make a, uh, an even longer story, uh, as brief as possible, he uh, convened the, that group to do some brainstorming. And from it, he selected a couple of us uh, yours truly in from education and a young geographer Kit Salter from UCLA mm. uh, the geographer he asked the two of us to sit down and see if we could put together uh, something that would serve as a convening of teachers from selected from around the country to meet in Washington, D.C. on an annual basis um, as an institute to develop a higher level understanding of geography. And this would be a different group each summer, mm -hmm. the idea was, so that over a period of seven or eight years with representatives from seven different states each year coming to Washington, D.C., and uh, that over a period of seven or eight years, do the math, we would cover the entire United States. That is, we would have had teachers from each of the, right. each state. Um, and the expectation was that those teachers, having graduated from this summer institute, they would go back to their own school system and, in, uh, and their own state. And in conjunction with a, 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 a university or college, that agreed to participate developed a geography center for that state. Oh. Um, and from there on, largely funded thereafter by the National Geographic Society to the tune of $50,000 a year, that uh, the, the, the purpose would be for them at the state level to promote the, the development mm -hmm. and growth of geography teaching. Well. Um, Kit Salter and I, borrow, borrowing heavily on the very successful model, model promoted by the National Writing Project, mm -hmm. all right, mm -hmm. um, we developed this model and in 1985 brought together the first group of teachers in Washington, D.C., and they then went out to their seven different states and developed their own summer institute the following year, and then also did field work out in the school systems. The idea was that through this so-called multiplier effect, mm -hmm. that again by the end of seven or eight years, we would have reached all 50 states right. in the United States and would have done something very constructive to promote the development of geography education nationwide. And I must admit, as I went into many of those states to follow up to see that the centers were created and mm -hmm. how the money was being used and so on, I was on more than one occasion startled to find that this university or this, that college no longer even offered geography. Not only didn't have a major, but didn't offer ge geography oh courses. Heavens. Again, given our rich history in geography here uh -huh. at Towson, I was absolutely stunned. Sure. Um, 
And I all the, all, saw all the more the need for a lot of education to go on uh -huh. um, and a lot of interest to be reinvested into geography. My own personal view, and professional view, is geography was essential. Yes. I mean, just look at it this way. Anything that happens, whether it's in literature or in history or whatever, anything that happens in this life happens somewhere. Yes. The somewhere means we're talking about a location, a place, geography. And our students, for instance, to be studying history or literature without the benefit of the geographic context is to be learning something which is largely in isolation and will have less meaning than it would if they could mm -hmm. understand that the background mm -hmm. of, of uh, geographically of where that event, where that thing was invented, what were the conditions at that time geographically in that area where Gutenberg invented that printing press and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So, uh, truth be told, that, that whole uh, ac activity um, was an adjunct activity for me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't essential to or central to right. the work I was doing here uh, at Towson at that time as dean. Right. Uh, but it was, it was education, and it was teacher education at the highest level. There was nothing better in my own professional life than working for those several years, almost 20 years, with those highly gifted and highly motivated teachers in Washington, D.C., who convened on, for those summer institutes, or to go out into a state, into Missouri, and see those teachers developing their own institute for teaching geography. And as a model for uh, promoting good teaching, I think there's a lot to recommend it. Mm -hmm. Again, we weren't all that clever. Uh, we didn't originate the idea. The National Writing Project had demonstrated already mm -hmm. its success, the success of that model. Um, uh, but uh, what we were doing, not but, and what we were doing was uh, really importing that model uh, and saying, all right, what you can do in the matter of writing and English, uh, teaching and learning, well, I, I bet we could do that with geography. And I think to a large extent, we were successful mm -hmm. in, doing, in, 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 in demonstrating that. Do you know if that program is, uh, continues? It has morphed into a, you know, a number of uh, different configurations. The, the statewide, uh, for instance, the state uh, centers for uh, geography education, once funded entirely uh, by National Geographic Society, its foundation, created again by Gil Grosvenor for that specific purpose, uh, those state-level uh, institutes now must develop for over a two or three year period uh, a proposal for which uh, the foundation, the Geographic Foundation, provides funding uh -huh. if they agree. I mean, it's a, on a grant basis. Uh -huh. Whereas once it was, if you have an institute and you have the teachers who are willing to do it, here's $50,000, yes. go do something. Uh -huh. And if you can raise Addition, if you can raise matching funds at the mm. state level, you have 100000 mm -hmm. instead of just 50000 mm -hmm. And several states did that. Um, and uh, they, they, they were all the, 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 the teachers were all the more fortunate and richer for, <laughs> for having raised the additional money. Uh -huh. So it, yes, it's, it continues to, to go. Um, uh, the program goes but it's in a different format and a different kind of funding. Um, not as prominent as it was, mm -hmm. but the, all of these things, whether of it's, course. you know, all of these things have their cycles. So, uh, and each one in its particular time and place has the spotlight and then kind of moves aside or is pushed aside. And it's nowhere more evident than in the field of education, mm -hmm. where we have one movement after another that uh, you know just is here today and then gone. I think in this particular case, as with the writing project, 
we have evidence that it has made a difference at the state level. Yes. Um, simply by, among other things, the uh, evidence of a real workforce of teachers who have joined in that on a voluntary basis, They're not getting anything for it, but have joined in this effort to uh, improve the teaching of videography in their own schools, in their state, and um, and many of whom, senior teachers, you know, have been in the field 20 years or more, who said that because of their experience, like with the writing project, who because of this experience have feel have feel regenerated as yes. teachers, they were before this looking to either retire or do something else, but this had quickened their interest, that is their participation in this, uh, in this particular kind of project, with teachers teaching other teachers what they do well. That, that whole idea, well, is it, that's, that's a pretty clever idea, <laughs> that, you know, and look at the, all the things that we learned from these other 20 or 30 teachers. If each one teaches all the others, something that he or she does well mm -hmm. in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's 30. A whole lot of learning. Ideas. That's a whole lot of learning. <laughs> and uh, the question would be, why, why haven't we learned to do more of it in other fields? So you know, couldn't we do that in math? Couldn't we do that in science areas? No. You, one would think. You would, you would think, yes. Is there anything that we haven't talked about, especially in regard to your career and your perspective, th this wonderful perspective you bring to things? Um, you were sort of suggesting that everything happens, curriculum, instructional models happen cyclically, so you know, sure. we're probably bound to see it again in some, some iteration. Um, from all of your your research, all of your interaction with people, are there certain elements that in teacher education that you think are critical pieces to what we do that sort of stand that test, that sort of recycling of everything and are always there? Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm uh, reminded that, uh, uh, in response to that, I'm reminded that um, in my own experience, both personally and professionally, there is nothing more important in the classroom than the, than the teacher uh -huh. and where we can guarantee ourselves, our students, and our constituents that we have a great teacher in that classroom, that's really all we need to know. Give that dynamic or otherwise effective person a group of students, any age, any grade level, with sufficient, that is with a teacher, with a sufficient background and understanding of what he or she's trying to teach. Mm -hmm. And that's really all we need to know and that's all the public would demand if they thought we had great teachers in every classroom. There'd be far less emphasis on this statewide and national testing. Why do we have that testing for the most part? For whatever other benefits it may, we have that testing um, and the hours and dollars consumed in testing because we cannot guarantee that we have great teaching going on in every classroom. And so, therefore, what should we do? Test to find out where, it, where it's uh, working and where it isn't. Well, in my view, my own view, and I, th I think, I'm in my, and I'm immodest enough to think that other reasonable people would agree that those tests, first of all, only re reveal a modicum of what we really want as uh, outcomes in a classroom. Give my, give me, uh, as the parent of a youngster in, at any level, middle school, a choice between an adequate teacher with a superior battery of tests 
were a great teacher, and I don't know what kind of tests he or she <laughs> uses. I'll take the one who you and I intersubjectively would agree is a great teacher. If you, if you, <laughs> if you want your kid to have a great experience, be sure that he or she has that person as a teacher. Um, there are people I could point to in my own growth as a person, as a teacher. Two or three who quickly come to mind, none of, none of whom is a teacher educator per se, um, but a, a teacher. Um, what they have in common is they were great in the classroom. They were great in the classroom. Great in the sense of by their persona, by their understanding of what they taught, they, they commanded your attention and your want to be like them. Mm -hmm. and study hard <laughs> to, to know what they know. Find out what book they're using in, in addition to the textbook so you could run mm -hmm. to the internet or the library and get a copy of that book yourself mm -hmm. and sit down and read it. Um, again, we, we don't have enough great teachers uh, to, to put one in every classroom. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I recognize that to suggest we will or <laughs> can afford to is, is, well, to use a common f term, idealistic, mm -hmm. although I don't like the application of that term to what I'm describing. Uh, that is to say, it just isn't going to happen in the, in mm -hmm. the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, in, it, in the absence of a great teacher in every classroom, we need teachers who, what? know something mm -hmm. and know it well mm -hmm. so that they know more than their students about it mm -hmm. uh, and while command of the subject matter is not the only thing particularly at the senior you know at the secondary level it's an important thing we not only teach someone we teach someone something mm -hmm. and we uh, better than anybody else the we who teach need to, to understand the nuances of what we teach as well as the linear facts and that, that type of thing. So we need people who, who know something, who are absolutely in, uh, curious about everything. Um, not just their subject, but about life itself and the world and books and literature and geography. And, because those are the kind of people our, our kids, our students really like. They like people who are curious and every now and then will pause in their teaching to say, gee, I wonder where that idea came from. I wonder if, if we could find that out. Uh, so on and so forth. Who don't pretend to know everything right. about everything, but are curious about everything, and particularly what, the, what they teach. Who like, who like people in general. They like being with people of all ages, but particularly in the case of teaching, children and or uh, adolescents who, who, not, who don't just tolerate them, but they really like them. Um, you, I, I, you can be a good teacher and not really like kids. You, can, you could do that, but it's going to be a much more of a challenge to you. And it's going to be much more difficult than if you like your clients, you're like, okay. Um, and I think we need to bring people into the classroom who are enthusi enthusiastic about life, about kids, about what they teach, and aren't, you know, afraid to show that curiosity, enthusiasm in the classroom. Uh, I think those qualities, among several others, are the, are the qualities that we need to be looking for and developing in our, 
prospective teachers mm -hmm. um, if we want and where we want education to succeed. And yes, paper and pencil assessments, <laughs> performance assessment, if you please, and so on. Uh, but I, th I think that the current emphasis on those paper and pencil assessments is soon, if it continues, if it continues the way it, it, it has developed over the past several years, is going to burn out the best of our teachers. Mm. Mm. And others among the best who aren't burned out are just going to give it up. They're going to say, I don't need this in my life. And I don't like, and I don't like doing this to these kids and trying to convince them that this is really important stuff. Hmm. Now, about this and a few other things, I may be incorrect. <laughs> 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 but I obviously don't think so. But you have strong convictions about it. I think it. I do. I yes. think you do, too. Well, given all of those last thoughts, what would you say to someone? I have these paper and pencil tests in my head right now. Mm -hmm. What would you say to someone who's considering a career in teaching? Go for it. Do it. Try it. Don't don't tell me that if you try it and don't like it, that'll be wasted time. Now, that's an insult to yourself to, to suggest that. Um, it, it may be wasted time in terms of getting yourself into a certain place on a on a financial ladder. Mm. But to say that I spent two years doing this or that, anything, including teaching, mm -hmm. and only to find out. It really isn't my niche. Mm -hmm. I can do it, but I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I can do it, but I don't like it. Uh, I can do it, but it's too too much work. Mm -hmm. um, is to have learned something yes. about yourself and about a field of endeavor, and take that education, take that learning, and uh, if you're a good problem solver, you can move over somewhere else, continuing your education, and develop a career ladder somewhere else. Um, but if you've got talent and curiosity and, uh, and these other things that I was mentioning, uh -huh. um, try it. Yes. Because if you try it and you enjoy it and your kids enjoy you uh, and you're getting good results, I, I personally and professionally can't think of a better way to spend your life. And that's a way to think of teaching, I think as quite frankly any other career line, you are not only choosing a vocation, you're choosing a way of life for yourself. It's a way of life that demands hard work, long hours, uh, interacting with people sometimes you don't like, but they're, you know, you have to deal with them. Uh, um, but an enormously rewarding uh, field of endeavor and way of life. If you enjoy it, if you get into it and don't enjoy it, get out. Otherwise, you'll feel, you will feel stuck and there's nothing, what could, what could be more sour <laughs> than someone who early in his or her career, including teaching, decides, I can do this, but boy, I'd really like to be somewhere else. Well, to think of spending another 5, 10, 15, 20 or more years in an environment where you feel stuck. Yeah. Who wants to be there? And what makes you think that kids, in this particular case of teaching, students will profit uh, by your sour disposition? Uh, so, uh, it, yeah, it's... The time, the years you've spent trying to teach, and it doesn't work, they won't be wasted if you choose not to waste them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Be a good problem solver. Yeah. Um, but it can be rewarding. Oh, yes. Most of us who, who teach and enjoy teaching 
could do other things. But we choose not to in part, not solely, but in part because we enjoy what we're doing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it is rewarding. And we like to tell other people about it. We don't <laughs> shy from telling them, and particularly our students. Try teaching. Yeah. Yeah. Don't give up on the idea as a sophomore in college. You have an idea you'd like to teach. If you think you see in yourself some talents, I'd particularly encourage you to try teaching. It won't be wasted effort. It won't be wasted time. What the hell? You've got a whole life. Those of you <laughs> sitting in the college classroom right now probably will live to be 100. Mm -hmm. You've got another 80 years to <laughs> make those life decisions. and. Uh, you, you don't want to be stuck with, in doing something you don't enjoy, but um, if you think you would enjoy teaching, try it. Well, now you've told a larger audience this by virtue of, ta <laughs> yes, by virtue of talking <laughs> with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.